Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we are going to give an overview of the book of Esther. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm joined today by Dr. Tim Edwards. Dr. Edwards, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So Esther, I was thinking about, I was talking with my wife about this book yesterday, and I was thinking, this is kind of like a Shakespearean comedy. <laughs> and it's and it's a really unique book in that there's not really anything else like this in scripture. So the there's all these major reversals. And this is like a beloved story that kind of just has the palace intrigue, even the settings of it is kind of royalty. The stakes are super high. Yeah. Uh, so this is just a really good story. So we, be- we better not screw this pod- no, no, no. this podcast up. Um, what would be your kind of initial um, advice to people in how to read and approach this, I don't know, genre or just this story in the Bible? Um, well, the fact that it's narrative and it's, it is telling a story, you would want to read it in, uh, with that in mind. It's c- carefully crafted. It's uh, written with a particular purpose in mind, it seems, which is tied to the institution of a festival that is not ordained in the Torah. So in that sense, it's quite dramatic. uh, And it has that function. And so knowing the point of the letter is to uh, bring support and justification for a festival that isn't ordained by Moses and doesn't have that divine sanction uh, yeah. What about Torah. that regulative principle, the right? Re- <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you read it, carefully crafted narrative, telling a story of the deliverance of uh, the people of Israel in exile um, with the, the, the hope of encouraging a celebration, which clearly was very successful because it is still celebrated uh, today. Yeah, uh, I think even later this month, yeah, it, it's, it's coming up. It's, it's, it's uh, quite the celebration that you have... Lots of dressing up, lots of uh, tricks and parties, and it's it's yeah. a fun time in Israel. Yeah, can, can you tell us a little bit more about? Because uh, so that's foreign. We don't celebrate that here. But so yeah, what kinds of things do they do? And I'm guessing they read this story. They re- they read the story. Have synagogue services. You. Um, uh, there are there are parades. People dress up in fancy dress and pretty dramatic events. You have people pulling pranks. I mean, the um, the uh, there are occasions a bit like an April Fool's type prank, but it's in Purim. So they put some gallows in front of people's houses. Or something. <laughs> they, they, they don't go that far, but you you find uh, there was one on a on a website a few years ago where it said suddenly we've we found uh, the Book of Esther at Qumran. Okay, and and the particular. Um, method of being able to identify it was the Book of Esther was the eating of particular uh, magic mushrooms, which enabled you to see through. You know, and so, uh, yeah. You know, so it's an excuse. It's for a, civically. It's a civic excuse for a party for and some fun. Part, okay. And uh, and uh, it, and it's quite raucous. I mean, okay. there is a there is. So a is this command. the Mardi Gras of the Jews, basically? A little bit. So you have a you have a. Um, a command in the Talmud that, uh, that said you, sh- you should, uh, in celebrating Purim, you should drink so much that you can't distinguish between Haman and Mordecai, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, I, there you go. It's a time to, to celebrate, they yeah. would say. Uh, so going back to uh, the c- historical context of this story, we just situate uh, this for us. So we, we just came out of reading the prophets, we uh, so so the Jews are in exile. What are some of the kind of major historical events that we should keep in mind um, as we're um, kind of coming to this foreign capital of Susa in uh, this is like modern day Iran now? Um, so what are some of the key events that have happened around this time? Um, so the I mean in terms of the the major key event that has happened is the transfer of power from one empire to another, yeah. from the, Babylo- the defeat of the Babylonian Empire to the, uh, the Persians. And then you have the law of the Medes and Persians that's referred to in here. And so that is, um, that is the, the major shift, uh, in, t- in one sense, from, uh, for, from the Israelites' perspective in exile. They now have, they're now under a control of a different empire, which obviously had dramatic uh, effects for them because it was 
that Cyrus who sent, sends them back. There's a different international policy, a different foreign policy in this new empire. And so um, uh, that is the uh, historical situation. And now there's... Uh, I'm not an uh, expert in, and it doesn't interest me actually that much in terms of going all, all the exact uh, lining up of who this king is with this king. And there, you know, is, who is Ahasuerus? I spent a yesterday doing that you work. You did that? Good. And it, I, was, it was, it is a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge. Who, who, which king does it relate to and yeah. uh, how does it tie up with Herodotus's version of events and all right. those sorts of things? It's, it's, and that doesn't excite me enough to put the time <laughs> in. So... So yeah, I, I'll I think ask it was you. just because I. Let me ask you, Aaron. So seeing you spent yesterday yeah, doing this. Yeah, since I spent yesterday, I might as well make make use yeah. of it. So basically, there's there's two views on who. The, the big question is, who is the king? So who is the who is Ahasuerus, or however you want to pronounce his name? And there's kind of the modern view. And if you have like something like the ESV Study Bible, which is like a pretty good evangelical Bible with lots of good stuff in it. Uh, they, this, they would be a good example of kind of the modern view, which uh, t- places, uh, I think it's uh, Long- Longominus as the king, and uh, the kind of older view, and this would be a view by someone like uh, Bishop Usher, who wrote the kind of annals of world history, every, I think that's what it's called. Um, With very specific dates for all, yeah, the, all the events. Yeah, tracing like the history from creation until now and uh, uh, John Gill some of the like kind of the older view and, and that's the view that is most persuasive to me because of what it does um, and how it understands the text of Ezra, Nehemiah Daniel and Esther and places those all together um, so I'll just put a few uh, kind of flags in the ground as far as the timeline so what, what everyone agrees on is that Cyrus uh, of Persia uh, decrees the rebuild of the temple 539 538 around there um, under uh, the view that, that I take kind of the older view Esther would have become queen around 515 BC um, Ezra then prepares uh, to go to Jerusalem uh, Haman is promoted in like 510 Esther intercedes for the Jews in 510. The Jews defend themselves. Purim is established in 509. And then Nehemiah is given permission to go to Jerusalem in 502. And when we get to Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, you'll see there's mentions of Cyrus, Artaxerxes, Darius, and it's hard to keep track of them all. But the basic argument is that these are throne names all referring to this, the same guy. Um, and if you want, if you want to do the deep dive on this, uh, James Jordan has a good monograph on this. And I think it's just called like Darius, Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes in the Bible it takes probably an hour to read. Um, and it, it kind of presents that standard argument. Um, the, the other cool thing about it is when Nehemiah, who's the cupbearer to the king is requesting uh, uh, to go back and rebuild the walls, it just mentions the queen there, and it would mean that that queen is is Esther. So there's a cool connection there. But it doesn't affect too much your inter- interpretation of Esther. It will affect how you understand Daniel and 70 weeks and the years and when the exile ends and yep. stuff like that. So that is neither here nor there. So let's get back but into, thank you for into doing the that book. Work but for yeah, us, I'm, Aaron, glad, I'm pre- glad I did it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the, the other thing I like to do is I like to go on Google Maps and just see what the uh, kind of where these places are. And so you open the book opens and we're in the Persian capital of, of Susa. It's modern day. I think it's like Shusha. Uh, I think that's just what, what, what it'll be in Google Maps. And this is about a thousand miles from Jerusalem. So if you're thinking about the Jews who are taken, uh, if, if you're in the... Uh, if you're in the southern kingdom of Judah, yeah, that's a long ways that's to go. It's a long way to go. That's like a 20-hour drive, yeah, uh, but, but, but they didn't have cars. Not too many rest stops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also uh, amazing how big the Persian kingdom was. Mm-hmm. So this is, we're talking an enormous amount of uh, land and peoples, of diverse peoples, and we, say, and we see here 
this is 127 provinces. So uh, this is an enormous uh, amount of land to rule over. Um, do you have any thoughts on who wrote the book and whether that matters to um, either the purpose of it, which is to uh, maybe a justification for Purim, or um, yeah, any thoughts on I do, I, 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 It doesn't tell us <coughs> who wrote it, so we are allowed to be um, sit, on, sit on the fence there. Um, one assumes uh, it, for it to be accepted uh, into the canon uh, and to have the effect that it did in terms of setting up Purim and things that um, someone with authority is at least um, promulgating it, if not being author of it, whether it's um, an Ezra and Nehemiah figure or whether it's uh, someone closely related to them. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're not told. Obviously, someone has information about all that happened in in reasonably secret places, King's Court. It's, so they have to have spoken to Mordecai and Esther yeah. if, if uh, they weren't involved in the writing process. Yeah. Okay, so here's how uh, I'd like us to approach the book if possible, and that's by looking at each of these characters, and we'll just uh, take them kind of as they, as they show up in the book. So the book opens, uh, now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, and then in parentheses in, in my Bible at least, it says, this was the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. So even there I see kind of, they're making a distinction. It's, it's this guy. Um, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his king, Kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, and then he gives this big feast. And there's this question here about, uh, is the king, so he's a king doing king-like things. He's throwing this ridiculously lavish feast that uh, is kind of unheard of. I, I think it says, you know, even every gold uh, chalice was different. So uh, this is a lot of wealth. Yes, there's the, yeah, and that, I think that's the intention of the d- description, everyone's meant to have their jaws on the floor at this point, going, "Oh my goodness, this is this isn't any old little kingdom and party." Yeah, so we're at the the apex of wealth in the center. This is this is the center of the the world at the time, and then the king asks for Queen Vashti to come. So he kind of wants to to show her off. How would you describe uh, that request? That command. Uh, some think it's like a bunch of uh, drunk dudes at a party, and it's like bring bring out the models so you know we can ogle them. Is that what is happening here, or would you take it uh, maybe differently than that? Well, we have we have the fact that Queen Vashti is is making an equivalent type feast uh, for the women, so it's a uh, you know, protocol seems to be functioning, and that the the guys have got their event happening and the girls have got their event happening. Um, and uh, so there are two possible ways. The Queen Vashti may be refusing to come because it's clearly a breach of protocol. Mm-hmm. You've got your event, we've got our event, the two don't mix. Um, and therefore, what is happening is he's drunk too much he's you know he's and he's decided to show off his wife uh, and and that and she refuses and says no that's not just not protocol that's not how it's done uh, or it could be um you know that she's just putting her foot down to a perfectly reasonable request um in in those days and at that time um but the very fact that uh, I mean, it makes him makes him furious. But it seems to be the, the f- it's furious because he's embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Um, do I think she was doing the right thing not to go or not to go? It's really hard to know, one way or the other. So you'd say uh, that the text is ambiguous. The text is ambiguous. Certainly, in certain, some some of the sort of traditions of interpretation I've uh, read, the, the request of the king is sort of um, put in more dramatic terms to indicate that it was a, 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 a wrongful request and Queen Vashti refused um, a, a wrong re- a request that was wrong. 
Um, but I think that the text itself doesn't really uh, tell us one way or the other. She, she's not condemned by the text. It's just, uh, in one sense, it's a setup for uh, the vacancy. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's a different world back then. We have to understand. Yeah, this seems like this feels very different yeah. than anything we yeah. are it's, familiar it's, with. It's a it's a very very different world, and interpreting the um, cultural faux pas that someone is making or not making or is 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 is, is quite tricky. Um, I, I it, it seems to me that it was probably a. It was an unusual request. It wasn't an, un an unexpected request. And um, uh, it prompted embarrassment and, and then fear that, goodness me, ev everyone, every man's household is going to get out of hand if, if this sort of thing is repeated. Yeah. So we need to make an example, which is you get the, I get the sense that the hole just gets deeper as, they, as, as the story proceeds in this regard, uh, which is, you know, that happens. You ask someone to do something that's silly, yeah. they don't do it, and then you have to cover up your embarrassment and you find yourself in a far, far worse position yeah. <laughs> later than you ever thought you would ever be. Yeah, I think the closest analogy I could think of is if it's like the president and the first lady, they're... Uh, uh, in a in a very public setting, both of them, uh, I, I've, is it Jill who is President Biden's wife now? I was thinking more like Trump and Melania because that, that was the previous administration. But if there was a overt disobedience by the first lady, you imagine the kind of news cycles and what they would do with it, and how it could also destabilize the actual empire stocks start to drop and uh, other nations think, oh, this king might be susceptible. So uh, when, I, when I read the text, I, I sometimes wonder, uh, maybe the queen is conspiring with some other, um, there could be some other foreign constituency that wants to use this to exploit the king. We know that um, this is a 127 provinces. He can't, not everyone loves him. In fact, some of his own eunuchs want to want to take him out mm. later on uh, but yeah I, I it still seems ambiguous to me whether uh you know she was uh whether how unreasonable or not or maybe i should say how malicious she was in denying uh the king's the king's request uh, at the end it, it seems that do you take it as a divorce decree because it says you know she's never going to come before the king again uh it's kind of hard to imagine a marriage in which you don't ever see uh, your spouse. But even when Esther becomes queen, apparently she goes like 30 days without seeing him. So this is just a really foreign kind of marriage or courtly relationship. Yeah. You could, I would imagine she would have continued living in the court in some form or other, but as a, uh, a shunned wife of, mm. of, of the past. Okay. Um, you, you can't imagine Queen Vashti... Uh, Walking off, you know, packing her bags, walking out of the thing, and getting married again. You know, right. the idea of marrying the former king's, the former queen, is not something that's going to go down too well. Yeah, I mean, Absalom does something like that with David's concubines, and that—that's part of the power play. That's right? the power play, yeah. And it, and I mean, also, what what is striking in the in these times, putting someone to death is not a big deal. In the, um, if Queen Vashti really did, if 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 she disobeyed, she embarrassed him. She did the fact that she's not put away, yeah. and as opposed to just shunned in the court, but actually put to death, she is she is denied. She said no to the king. Yeah, a lot of people die for doing those sorts of things, and I, and I wonder if that the punishment is harsh in our mind, but it's not as harsh as it could have been. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I remember, you know, when you think of the Joseph story, which, where you have a slave there who is being accused by the wife of uh, trying to uh, sexually assault her in, in many ways, 
um, he just gets thrown in jail. And a lot of commentators, particularly ancient commentators, have said uh, Potiphar clearly knew that this was a setup and so didn't kill him. I mean, a slave is nothing right. to anyone. So killing a slave is, in the ancient world, is... That's your property. You can yeah, do what it's, you it's, want. Yeah, it's, not a, it's really not a big deal yeah. at all. Um, and yet Joseph isn't killed for apparently doing some, being accused of something very, very serious. And I think in this situation, I, you know, part of me wonders whether the fact that that doesn't occur is maybe respectful to her position, but at the same time um, indicates perhaps that the king is aware that uh, he's got himself in a corner. Yeah, and chapter 2 begins, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. And then the servants are like, uh, okay, we need to need, help need this wife. king. <laughs> and and it, it kind of reads almost like maybe the king is remorseful, regretful. He realizes maybe I, I would just act it out of anger and... I kind of miss my my Vashti. Miss Vashti, and so the servants are like, "This isn't good. We need we need to find him a new one." So let's go out throughout the kingdom and and gather virgins for for the for the king. Uh, so take us into this section because this reads kind of like a beauty pageant, America's top model kind of thing. Is that what is happening here? How do we even think about a? Uh, Oh, all these beautiful young virgins who have to be pampered for like a year. I don't know if it just really smelled that bad and they needed to be oiled and murdered for, for a year before they could be brought before the king. And I'm just wondering, like, what do they do? And... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, the, the foreignness of... The cultural foreignness to us is 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 perhaps more present in these sorts of sections than others it's um, yeah, obviously the, the king is held in very high regard um, he is uh, not not your everyday mortal in that sense and one uh, one assumes therefore that a, a, a young lady drawn from non-royal stock uh, needs to have some form of you know preparation in order to make that transition because there will be some she will beca- become a different person yeah. in it, as soon as she becomes the king's wife she becomes the queen uh, and so th- you would get the sense that there's the, there are ancient sort of uh, cultural realities that, that mean that this has to come and, and, and one assumes there's a lot of education that needs to happen in terms of um, what this would mean, what you can and can't do, what you can and can't say. Which fork uh, yeah, or spoon, spoon you use. use <laughs> all those sorts of things. Um, so it does seem extraordinarily elaborate and foreign to us. Uh, although, you know, in, in one sense we, you know, people get married quickly uh, here, but, you know, the there was an the time between meeting and getting married and that engagement process and courtship and engagement, et cetera, is, is a time where, where all questions can be asked. You know, is this the right person? Should I be doing this? Once you get married, those questions stop and you go, now, how do I do this yeah. with this particular person? Um, and there's, there's an element that that selection process is happening from day one in this 12-month preparation. Mm-hmm. Um, how is how are the women comporting themselves? How uh, you know how they're responding to all this the, the life in the palace and what it means? And obviously, there's the the oils and the clothing, all that sort of stuff that's going on at the same time. But uh, the king doesn't want to rush into something. Yeah. So they're being enculturated in addition to being being beautified. I would, yeah, I would say that must, that was that would be part of it. Yeah. And do you think when so Esther, who knows exactly how old she is, but one assumes a, a young lady, is she 
thinking this is a good thing? Like, is it an honor? Or, I mean, everyone would have known about the Vashti incident, right? So you can imagine all sorts of mixed motives. And I just think if this was my daughter, how would I be feeling about this, right? Yeah, this is... This is one of the Bible stories where you don't do this at home, folks. Yeah. It fills. Um, you guys remember Song of Solomon? You remember Ruth? What we said about those? You know, it's <laughs> it's it's a, uh, um, and there are some. So the interesting thing about the Book of Esther, there are three different versions. There's the Hebrew Masoretic text version. You have the Greek version, and then you have the uh, later Aramaic Targum version. And the striking thing is, they're all all three are different. Um, they all have the same story and the same ending, so that's good. Um, but in the Greek version, you have prayers inserted, God is active, uh, Mordecai and Esther are very p- pious and observant Jews and doing all that's necessary, and the same with the Aramaic Targum, but there's different ways of expressing it. Whereas the Hebrew text, as it stands, God doesn't get a mention. He's uh, not in the, in the book explicitly. There are no prayers. There's no observance. Uh, and there are some of us said, uh, you know, the Hebrew version is, is there as a warning to what, what could happen in, a, in a, uh, an exilic context where assimilation is allowed to happen. You know, it's like, it's, you know. You, it's a cautionary it's, tale. It's a cautionary tale. Yeah. You know, um, no, I, th- I think that's a very modern take uh, on it. But it is very striking. It is questions, why is Mordecai saying to Esther to, to do this. Now, the end is a glorious salvation. Yeah. Uh, but did the end ends justify the means? And this, you know, that is the question that you're left with, even at the end. Yeah. Um, you know what? No good Jewish girl grows up wanting to become part of the harem of, and, a, and therefore a wife of a pagan king. That's not a traditional Jewish root. Uh, uh, and so it's odd. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Mordecai because he is, as you mentioned, the drinking until you can't tell, tell the difference. Uh, some have painted Mordecai as uh, kind of a stubborn, proud man. He won't. He he won't show honor to whom honor is due. Romans thirteen, right? Uh, and and there's a question there about uh, whether he's actually being obedient uh, to God's command or not. Uh, he is mentioned in in the list in Ezra Nehemiah in that in that group of um, exiles that that returned, and he seems to be a a pillar. Like kind of a, a leader, maybe an elder uh, there. So, what do you make of Mordecai and some of his actions here, especially leading up to? He definitely has some really like key redemptive moments when he's telling Esther uh, what I take as a confession of faith that even if she doesn't do this, God's going to deliver them. But maybe you were born for a, a time like this. Um, but prior to that, he he did kind of he is the reason why Haman wants to exterminate them. Yes, um, and it all starts with this refusal to just do a little bow when Haman walks past. Yeah. And nowhere in the text does it say why he refuses to do that. Um, and you know there are various solutions that are suggested. Some say Haman is taking on sort of semi-divine status in his you know, that that and and for. For Mordecai to bow to him would be idolatrous in that respect. So there's, that's one suggestion. Others suggested that Mordecai, uh, Haman has idolatry, uh, idolatrous images on his turban or on his work. So to bow to him would be also doing that. Others say Mordecai is just saying, no, I can only bow to God. Because the, the Hebrew there is to do obeisance. It's, you know, usually, you know, come to us, kneel and bow down and worship God. That's, that language is the language that's used in Esther in terms of not bowing down. Um, and then finally, the one which I think is uh, the sort of underlying thread in the story, which is an interesting one, you know, Mordecai is a Benjamite yeah. from the line of Kish and Saul, and Haman is from an Amalekite. And so it's being portrayed as the, the final 
battle between you know the descendant of Saul who's going to actually finish off the yeah. work that Saul didn't finish, and therefore the the, the, la- the refusal to bow is that, that Mordecai has some sort of intuition that this is the case. You should never bow to an Amalekite, yeah. and we know that he's a- now how. We know those things because genealogies are given and, you know, we can cross-reference from the here and there and go, oh, look, isn't that great? Um, but the Mordecai knows that is, is another matter. So those are the four re- usual reasons. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, it's not, in one sense, it's not too dissimilar to, you know, why does Daniel refuse to eat yeah. the the meat of the king is there, is there a Jewish kosher laws is it this that or that it's not actually clear mm-hmm. why he does it but the fruit of that actions is shows that it was a, a, he was doing it faithfully yeah. and I think in in this instance the st- you know the end of the story is such that um, uh, whatever his reasons the domino that started the chain of dominoes falling out was a, it was a good thing to set go, set set loose. Yeah. So let's explore this a little more because I th- I think for me at least it helps answer the question uh, of why it was okay even good for the Jews to go on the on the offensive. So uh, the the decree gets reversed. They're able to actually defend themselves, and then they kill. Um, I think was it five hundred in the capital. And then uh, some some thousands throughout the yeah, and so we we grew up with uh, we're supposed to love our enemies and do good, and so you uh, as a Christian you come to a text like that and it kind of throws you for a loop. So the way that I would try to answer that I think would be going back to the the Agai, uh, so so the original command to. Saul in First Samuel 15, I believe, is you need to go kill kill them, kill them all dead, and this is like a holy warfare thing. Samuel shows up. What's this I hear? Oh, and you also save the king. And then that great line where it says Samuel hacked him to pieces, and you think, wow, okay, this this is serious. And so now you have someone from the line uh, of Agag. So they've already been like marked. The Amalekites have been marked. And so that disobedience from Saul now is, uh, as, as you mentioned, now Mordecai and Esther, who is co- who's connected, right? So fr- from that line, in that royal position, is able to legally obey that command from, I don't know, a thousand years ago? <laughs> or Yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a ways ago. So... Um, that would be kind of my understanding of their justification for actually putting the Amalekites to death. Uh, what are the other kind of options or are there any other kind of reasons you would find persuasive um, that explains that? Um, I mean, the, 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 the trouble with that one is the people who die aren't necessarily Amalekites. It's Haman who's the Amalekite. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know who the, the other ones are. They're just... Yeah. They're, they're just Stubborn people who, you know, do, want to keep fighting. I don't know. It's it's hard to. Do. Um, so some have suggested that the uh, the wording of the command for revenge actually doesn't it comes from from the king himself, and 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 sort of try and put a put a um, a little bit of distance between the Jews and their uh, and and the slaughter in terms of. It was really not Mordecai's idea or the king's. It was, it was the king's idea, it was the king's words for them to do that. Um, and other go well. It, the point is, it's self-defense, and ultimately, it's just, it's a uh, their their very existence was put at risk, and it continued to be at risk because of the nature of how laws work mm-hmm. there, and therefore they had to defend themselves. Now, the, the inclusion of women and children in there makes that more difficult, but the ancient Near Eastern world, that's how, how life was. Um, whereas the, the, the idea that 
the command or the desire to destroy Israel came from an Amalekite, and the Amalekites are devoted to destruction, cherem is the Hebrew term, would include women and children and property and all those sorts of things. So there is there's a logical consistency with the way the story is told and its connection with the Amalekites that uh, makes sense. And we have to just realize that ancient, you know, that, that principle of complete destruction um, is, yeah, to the modern modern ear and the modern sensibility, that's 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 difficult to to get your head around. Yeah, because we're not, we're um, war is about defeating your enemies with as little cost to them and yourselves as possible in many ways, yeah. um, which is a very modern warfare idea because. Uh, as warfare back then literally was man to man and and you realized it people's just you know honor to revenge your father and your father's father is very strong in in those in those cultures and therefore uh, to put an end to conflict often is well if you destroy everything then the end conflict is over it's yeah. done with we're gone yeah and you, you have these uh, this refrain throughout that they did not lay their hands on the plunder, which seems to, even if they weren't Amalekites, it seems like the Jews at least are self-consciously, they're thinking of it in terms of holy holy warfare, um, some kind of cl- cleansing that's happening there. Um, okay, let's talk about the the heroine of, of the book, Esther. Um, so how do you understand her kind of character development going from this young, we, we assume, lady into the harem. She, so she becomes his wife mm-hmm. and then it's only, and still keeps her, and her identity is, is hidden. Mm-hmm. And when the, uh, the plot against the Jews unfolds, it's only at that point in which she is forced to really be courageous. Um, so just tell us, how would you understand her character development, her sanctification through this? At what point is she does, she, does she have a moment of like transformation or is she being faithful throughout? One wonders, was she compromised? Because these, so the uh, the women in the harem, it says, they go to him at e- the king at evening and they come back in the morning. One wonders what kind of conversation is happening during that time. And like the Jews are still bound by by these laws of marriage, I mean, they they esteem this very highly. You can't imagine someone willingly giving themselves over to it. So I'm just trying to understand in Esther's mind what was she experiencing. Um, well, I'd, I think it would be a it would be strange. If partway through this whole this whole um, event, she has some sort of epiphany and understanding of uh, her now she should use her position for what is good. If she if, if she didn't go into the the whole thing under Mordecai's counsel and advice, which clearly was uh, instigating her uh, entering into this relationship with the king, if she didn't understand that as uh, in some form or other necessary for her as a faithful Jewish person um, to, uh, for whatever reason, whether they're, I mean, there's no, there's no indication in the text that Mordecai or anyone had premonitions of what would come in other versions and in sort of expansions of it, that is... Doesn't he have like a dream yeah, at the beginning? Yeah, so he's aware there's a danger coming and therefore Esther needs to get into position in order to, to make the deliverance. Which, you know, but for filling in the gaps of the story in terms of answering these questions makes perfect sense. It seems a strange thing to go, oh, the king needs a wife. My niece is a good, good and she's pretty, you know. Yeah. That was a great, great, great option. That seems... Not something you you would uh, think of as a faithful Jew. And Mordecai is being presented as faithful in that. Yeah. So I, my my sense is that she is uh, she is being faithful all the way through, um, 
And faithfulness breeds faithfulness. And so when that t- moment of um, life-threatening moment of going into the king's presence comes, although it's a deep breath moment for her, mm-hmm. she's, she's, she's been prepared for that um, in, in the previous years uh, of her life. Yeah. So that's how I would see it. Now, as you rightly have pointed out, that includes marrying a pagan <laughs> king, which is awkward. Yeah. But um, sometimes you got to take one for the team. <laughs> it's uh, uh, if it, you know, it, it's not the first strange thing that a faithful person has been asked to do in the past. You know, uh, I know a lot of people don't want Hosea's marriage to Goma to be historical. They want it to be allegorical. Yeah, I don't take it as that I take it as historical and that is a deep breath moment for a prophet yeah yeah we talked about that recently and yeah I think even Calvin takes it as a Calvin takes it as as like a vision or something like that he does Um, because it it, you can't imagine God ever coming to a prophet and say marry marry a woman I think prone to prostitution is that you know marry that woman who you know has those tendencies and then, not only that, is buy her back yeah. after she leaves you and then love her again. Um, that's just it's one of the more unusual commands in the Bible. Yeah. And, uh, and this would fall into that category. Um, so, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, so I would see a, as faithfulness is built on faithfulness to that crunch time. Mm-hmm. And then she has real she's really canny she's got in wisdom in terms of how she does the unveiling of Haman's um uh treachery mm-hmm. um and and uh so she's clearly becoming um you know she's streetwise about court life and how to do things yeah it's there are these echoes of kind of the Genesis three deceived by the serpent. And now she, the tables have turned and she's kind of a new jail in that sense, what she does to Sisera and Esther is now doing that to Yeah, She gets, Haman. catches Haman. Uh, yeah. And it, I mean, that's, that's that, so the, the, that makes everyone, you know, s- s- smile and all of the, you know, there's, uh, that that moment of exaltation in Haman's mind that he's been invited, <laughs> and uh, you know everyone's this just a smile spreads across everyone's face when they read yeah. that and go that is such human nature, yeah. you know, the, and then bang, he's yeah. on his he's on the knees pleading for his life. The it's funny the Haman is one of those characters who um, it's just like your classic. Villain. Uh, he has all the marks of uh, super proud, and you know, goes home and he's telling his friends, and you could tell, and even like the relationship with his wife is funny, and she's like, "Well, if uh, Mordecai is against you, you're going to bow before that Jew." <laughs> so, well, I mean, it's hard to know whether he's this the this archetypal, stereotypical bad guy who who gets what he deserves mm-hmm. in, a, in a surprising way or whether Esther has, has uh, caused us to understand what the archetypical, stereotypical bad guy is and now when we read right. it back we go, oh, he's the stereotypical. Yeah. No, he is the original. Yeah, he's the original. No, because it's, it, is, it is so, it's such a, uh, a fun Turn around. I mean, we we have it in Proverbs, we have it in Psalms. You know, the the wicked dig a pit for the righteous, and they fall in it. You know, that's proverbial. And we and uh, God catches the wicked in their own devices. Mm-hmm. That's a, yeah, so the principle is there, and then it's fleshed out in glorious technicolor yep. with Haman <laughs> getting hung in his own gallows, and it's it's 
we see it t- happen time and again, you know, an enemy of, of Christ or an enemy of the church will come and propose something. It'll look terrifying for a short moment in time, and then suddenly there'll be this moment of reversal, and uh, it will um, be, uh, they'll be destroyed. And uh, God, God loves the irony. This is, this is, this is a, that's a fast way. Sort of related, but it illustrates it. Um, I was, I was, I was, I was in Israel listening to a lot of masters. We had a guy, I think his name is Levi, I can't remember his name. His name. His name. And he was, he was, was talking about, about fighting, fighting war and war independence. Uh, and I think he's on television, television. And he said, and and the irony of it is yes. yes. that I was on television beach fighting for the newly declared state of Israel with an old Nazi German rifle that we had been provided by, by the Russians, I think, and given them. And he, and he, and he said, you can't, but... That's a, that's a Heyman moment. Yeah. Hitler and the Nazis wanted to destroy the Jews. And within a week of declaring an independent Jewish state, you have them using <laughs> Nazi rifles to defend that state. That's the sort of story God tells. It seems to me, yeah. and Haman is the the most fleshed out, beautifully told story of that. And then, and obviously, Christ's destruction of death by death is the ultimate uh, one. But yeah. um, it's uh, you know, in terms of a narrative retelling of it, Haman is that man. Yeah. The uh, so you mentioned the book is probably written with this explanation and justification for Purim, but the, one of the other major theological, um, I don't know, themes here that we're kind of talking about is God's sovereignty, his providence to preserve even uh, like especially hidden in, in the background here. And then all of these um, actions, coincidences, dreams, uh, happenstances that are orchestrated. And so this is also one of those books that plays with that tension of responsibility and, and sovereignty where, uh, and the, the most famous verse, Esther 4.14, where she goes in and says, you know, if I perish, I perish. Um, that, it, that is one of those kind of Daniel and throw, uh, into the, uh, and his three friends into the fire moments that they don't know at the time if this is going to do anything or if a deliverance is coming, but but they're walking by faith. Mm-hmm. And so I thought maybe uh, we could just close. Any final comments on kind of how we are to apply some of these doctrines mm-hmm. to our own life? I think the... Um, <laughs> We have to train uh, ourselves to think scripturally about the situations we're in. Um, and the narrative of Esther is part of scripture, and it, it should train us to think in a certain way. We we have the advantage of having the whole book, and when we read it, we once we've read it once, we know the story. So when we read it again, we know what's going on, and we're able to see those things. Esther is in the story, doesn't know, if I perish, I perish. That is a real moment, crisis moment of uh, um Haman is, looms large. He's a remarkably powerful man. Mordecai won't bow to him. Uh, so ha- when we live our lives, we need to say, Lord, I need to, I need to s- be seeing what's happening in light of the this, this scriptural examples and truths that you've revealed. Uh, and I remember seeing this very clearly when reading Psalm 1. You have the description of the righteous and the wicked. Uh, I remember seeing this clearly. I was teaching out in Russia, in central Russia. And uh, a small group, a really small group of church planters from Central Asia. So most of them had come forth out of Muslim context, they'd been converted and were here, and I'm teaching them the Psalms. And, uh, and I said to them, look, Psalm 1 here, this is long, for a short Psalm, a long description of the righteous. 
They don't do this. They're like this tree planted by streams of water, gives us food in the season, leaf doesn't wither, whatever it does prospers. So that, that is a long description for one verse in a psalm. It's usually a parallel line. You have this long. Uh, and I said the image is of one of a tree. It's got roots. It's not doesn't even see when heat comes. It doesn't, doesn't bother it. You know, there's all this sort of idea. I said, what about the wicked? Chaff. Wind blows away. I said, now look at the world. It feels the other way around. <laughs> you know. And then I said, look at you lot. Are you the chaff or are you the tree? I said, if you're thinking scripturally, you are that tree. And I said, all the government apparatus that's designed to stamp you out, I said, chaff. On. And you have to, th- you have just have to keep reminding yourself mm-hmm. that that is the case, because in God's providence and His purpose, uh, you know, the old Jew who won't bow to the, the the powerful man of the empire is the tree that will stand. Mm-hmm. And the powerful man of the empire is the chaff. The young Jewish teenage girl who's entering in by faith into this. Hey, um, is is the righteous tree that will bear fruit, and and uh, Haman again is is the chaff, and and but you know confidently the wind is coming to blow the chaff away. Yeah. If it doesn't come today, that doesn't make any change who I am and who they are. It doesn't change, and I think we just we uh, we we often allow the circumstances that we live under. Uh, whether they're personal or national in terms of difficulty, uh, to crowd out the basic element of truth in the, of the, of the world yeah. is that in the end, Christ is risen, and that's all that matters. Yeah. I like that you bring up Psalm 1, Esther's name, Myrtle, and in this time period, um, She's like this myrtle tree, this very fragrant. It's it's not the impressive cedar of Lebanon or, you know, like they would have in the monarchy. But it seems like that's the tree that marks this time period where they're scattered throughout the empire. And yet they're rooted and they're carrying the the aroma of Christ is might be how how we say it. And I think uh, that's even embedded in, in in her character. She's like a great example of that, that myrtle tree. In the king's palace, and and seemingly plucked from obscurity, a yeah. Jewish girl in exile, plucked from obscurity by her uncle to do this job, and they're still celebrating. I mean, that's it's uh, that's how God works. Well, up next we have the books of First and Second Chronicles. So, if you're looking for baby names, get ready. <laughs> Until next time, keep on reading.